I'm Elisa Parenti from Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. President Trump is the sole holdout among the G7 leaders on the climate change issue. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said the leaders made it clear the U.S. must live up to previous commitments to the Paris Accord. Trump says he will not be rushed into a decision. The U.S. has taken full responsibility for leaking information from Monday's bomb attack in Manchester. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson arranged a quick visit to London to apologize, saying the special relationship between both countries will withstand this breach of trust. Former House Speaker John Boehner says that aside from international affairs and foreign policy, President Trump's time in office has been, quote, a complete disaster. Boehner spoke at an energy conference in Houston. He also says the president shouldn't be allowed to tweet overnight. New airport screening equipment is being tested that could make the laptop and tablet ban a thing of the past. At least four companies are working on machines that would give screeners a high-definition, three-dimensional look into baggage and other electronic devices. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. From Washington, I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology is next. in London. This is Bloomberg Technology coming up. G7 leaders join the chorus calling on big tech to limit the spread of hate speech and terror propaganda online. We are live in Italy with all the details. Plus SoftBank's $500 million bet on improbable worlds. The CEO of the London-based VR startup joins us to discuss the investment and using the cash to build new realities. And the highs and lows of Bitcoin. We'll track the success and the wild swings of the digital currency on the Bloomberg. But first to our lead, Donald Trump made his G7 debut in Sicily, the final stop on his first international trip as president. Tensions were brewing over trade and climate change, but there was one topic the group of seven leaders were in agreement on. The need for internet companies to do, quote, substantially more to take extremist material offline. Now, the meeting comes just days after the terror attack in Manchester, which killed 22 people. Joining us now from the Sicilian town of Taormina, Bloomberg's Matt Miller, who's been covering the summit. And before you destroy my pronunciation of where exactly you are, Matt, give us first, really, the, the words coming out of here, redoubling their efforts against terror. There was some agreement today. Yeah, there was, and I think a little bit of unexpected agreement. When we came here uh, yesterday, there was an expectation that nothing would be accomplished because the Italians wanted to move on climate change, they wanted to move on global uh, global trade, and they wanted to move on immigration. Three things that everyone expected Donald Trump to disagree with or not even want to talk about. But obviously terrorism came to the fore because of the Manchester attacks. And Theresa May came here with an agenda. She wants internet companies social media companies like Google and Facebook to start using an algorithm that could block certain content uh, from people or certain messages and also figure out who's sending certain extremist content, stop them from putting it on the internet and maybe flag them so that the police would be uh, more, a more easily able to find or follow them. So she came away from here with an agreement that not only is in the communique but has its own separate communique where all seven of the G7 leaders pledged to get together and not only fight terrorism, but really clamp down on the Internet in order to do so. Fascinating. I mean, they say they're going to have an industry-led forum going forward to work together on the issues. And Theresa May really speaking up, saying this is a big step forward. But, Matt, therefore, talk to us perhaps about some of the broader viewpoints, because we know how much the UK has been focusing in on this and on the Internet companies. And the question is how much the Internet companies respond to this. But I want to get your take on some of the other key issues to our viewers, because they are interested in new areas of climate change, techno change technology. They are interested in the trade disputes. There was less agreement there. 
Yeah, there was much less agreement there. And I thought it was very interesting that Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, and the Germans said they were trying to convince Donald Trump to agree to back the Paris Accords. And that's what all of the other six uh, G7 leaders were trying to do with the argument that uh, climate change is good for your economy, working against it, that is, because it creates new jobs and things like clean energy tech. They pointed to new jobs and the success of those industries in Germany which have really gotten the jump on a lot of other countries in things like solar and battery power. And, of course, under, the, under President Obama, who was just with Angela Merkel in Berlin yesterday, we created a lot of jobs in the U.S. also with new battery factories in Michigan and on the West Coast. So they tried to come at Donald Trump with, with, that, uh, with that argument. The interesting thing, I think, is that uh, Gary Cohn said that Trump actually is, a very, is very concerned about the environment and is open to understanding the European take on climate change in the Paris Accord and that he's evolving. And these are things that I don't think he would have heard from Donald Trump on the campaign trail as it relates to climate change. So clearly there's been some change in his stance, but he still wants to take his time and wait before he decides on the Paris Accord. The ongoing evolution of Donald Trump. Bloomberg's Matt Miller, fantastic to have you. Staying up so late for us. Thank you very much indeed. Reporting live from Sicily. Have a very good weekend. Now, a story we're watching out for you on Asia. Sharp, it's forecasting its first annual profit in four years. Now, the company credits cost cuts under new owner Foxconn and sales fueled by demand for smaller flat screen display panels. Sharp has more than quadrupled in value since August when Foxconn bought control of the struggling Japanese electronics maker. Now, coming up, we take a look at the rise of AI and what that means for the way we live with a top UK tech government advisor. That's next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out. It's at Bloomberg Tech TV. Weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. San Francisco, 10 p.m. right here in London. This is Bloomberg. Now, the digital revolution is transforming the world and ushering in a new future of work. One person with big aims of helping society ride the wave of change is Eric van der Klee. The UK tech pioneer once headed accelerator programs Level 39 for Canary Wharf and Tech City UK. And he's now out with his next venture, the Centre for Digital Revolution, also known as C4DR. Now, the business development hub aims to support startups, especially those working on AI, blockchain, IoT, the Internet of Things, and robotics. Joining me out is the Centre for Digital Revolution CEO, Eric van der Klee. Wonderful to have you here. Good to be here. And talk to us first about this particular business development hub that is being launched, because what are the use cases that you're envisaging it being put forward to in society? Well, there's two things that C4DR will do. One is it will help corporates and startups figure out how to take advantage of these pioneering technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. But the other side is we're going to help society and government figure out how to cope with the impact of that and actually thrive. Something we believe is that technology, you know, we should be masters of the technology and use it for good in society. But we don't really know what to do yet. So C4DR will be creating a series of experiments to figure out what society can do to help cope with the effect of and use to our advantage these technologies. I mean, you were... Uh of course, an advisor to the government, on blockchain in particular. Was it almost a reverse inquiry here? You saw that the government wasn't quite understanding the applications of this new modern technology and how in which it could be used to address this new change that we see upon us? So governments and large, in, large institutions will always be slower to adopt new technologies. Mm. Uh, even things like blockchain, which just only a few years ago were you know, blockchain and Bitcoin was the money launderer's weapon of choice. <laughs> Until, of course, the government wrote that absolutely seminal white paper to say opportunity blockchain for government to create efficiencies. So once these technologies go through their, you know, the challenging initial cycle of being slightly wild west to start to be useful for, you know, efficiencies for companies and society, that's when you see standards emerging and use cases that are so profound. So, Eric, I'm, I'm 
can see that this is already though quite a crowded space. I'm looking at Microsoft Ventures. If you're into AI, you could go to that particular accelerator. Perhaps you could go to Level 39, your old haunt, if you're doing Bitcoin and blockchain. Why come to you? So we've creating a new model, slightly different. We're going to be co-investing with corporates to help build entirely new companies. So we're sharing the risk with them. This is really an interesting model. Um, the first what sort one... What amounts would you fund of a startup? So right, right the way from seed all the way to growth. Obviously, we're a younger business, and so we don't have as much capital as the bigger companies. But we take our stake by taking risk early stage with them in the growth. And we announced the first one with Swisscom. And we're going to be doing a very interesting, can't say exactly what it is, but it's a blockchain-related innovation with them. And uh, we'll let you know how that goes. Then talk to us, therefore. You've got the co corporates joining, co-investing, funds being raised. I'm also very interested in the Cocoon Networks Innovation Centre. Now, this is where the hub that you're creating, first of all, in London, is actually going to be based within their, their hub of London. Chinese back international investment platform you say the first of its kind what's interesting about this what's interesting about this is that the cocoon networks as our partner are as determined as we are to help crack the code on how european and uk companies can you know more satisfactorily expand to china when you think about it there's two or three unicorns a year that come out of the uk and europe but if we had real access to the chinese market yeah it could double that so that's what Cocoon Networks are very interested in. And this is just one of the first of many hubs. You, you, where else are we looking to expand this? So uh, C4DR is establishing itself in London, in Zurich, and in Shanghai initially. But we are in discussions, and uh, we're only three days old today. <laughs> uh, we've already had incredible response from around the world who also want to discuss with us the opportunity of bringing C4DR to their city. And while you're here, I mean, I, ha I have to ask, more about your experience having worked in the UK so well having worked within level 39 particularly in fintech we're at a, about to have a UK election yep. we are at the point of seeing brexit potentially being pushed through how much do you think startups are still very much keen to be expanding in London and it's still the best place to be the advantages that London brings are not going to go away overnight regardless of what happens about Brexit. In fact, it's interesting because an entrepreneur's mind is whatever you throw at them, their job is to figure out how to cope, isn't it? And, yeah. and to adapt. And so when you think about some of the uh, companies that have started, even overseas, come here and then grown, they've had access to the talent, the investment, some of the biggest single markets, English speaking, say, for our US companies, always choosing the UK as the first landing point into Europe. Mm. Things will change. Uh, uh, entrepreneurs will have to figure out how to get licensed in more territories. But they'll do that because the advantages of being here will still outweigh the disadvantages. And also on a day like today where we see these sorts of calls from geopolitical leaders, the G7, against tech juggernauts such as Facebook and Google, which many call London their European headquarters, yeah. where do you see, particularly in this time of electioneering, the digital role within, within society at the moment, within the world of the very sad effects of terror attacks and the like. Is tech responding in the way it should? And are we seeing tech a force for good or, or in terms sometimes for the negative? See, I heard today's calls and I thought that I didn't think of them as an attack against the tech company giants. I thought of them as society through our leaders explaining the world that we want to live in. That's more what, what it is. And bear in mind that all of this technology is so new. It is less, in some case, than 10 years old. So we have to learn the best practice to be able to use these for society in the right way. And what those leaders were doing was calling for measures to improve the way that these technologies are used. And the companies will respond, do you think? Oh, they should. The they should certainly listen. Well, they certainly are listening. And in many cases, they are responding. And the ones that want to continue to thrive will do so. What we don't want is thought police. What we do want is a safe place, uh, a safe and actually enriching environment for ourselves and our children. That's the utopia. Here's hoping. Eric van der Klee, always great to have you in. Come back, tell us more about how your new development and venture is continuing to grow Centre for Digital Come Revolution. Come and visit. <laughs> I will do indeed. Thank you very much indeed, of course, CEO of Centre for Digital Revolution, Eric van der Klee. Now coming up, London-based VR startup Improbable received a $500 million investment from SoftBank, one of the largest VC deals ever in the UK. We'll catch up with the CEO, Herman Narula. That's next. 
and a reminder of our new interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to it. You can send our producers a message if you want. Play along with the charts we bring you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only, though, I'm afraid. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Now, Apple is said to be bringing artificial intelligence to chips. Engineers at Apple are racing to catch their peers at Amazon and Alphabet in the booming field of artificial intelligence. According to a person familiar with the matter, Apple is working on a processor devoted specifically to AI-related tasks. Now, the chip would improve the way the company's device handled tasks that would otherwise require human intelligence, such as facial recognition and speech recognition. Apple declined to comment. And sticking with the chip sector, shares of NVIDIA hit an all-time high today. That's after Bloomberg reported that SoftBank is considering boosting its stake in the company. The firm would raise its holding over time and begin to work more closely with NVIDIA, the people have said, asking it not to be identified. Well, because the deliberations, they're private. Earlier this week, Bloomberg reported that SoftBank acquired a 4.9% stake in the chipmaker, making it the fourth largest shareholder. Now, SoftBank has also been looking at the VR space. Earlier this month, the company led a $500 million investment in a London-based VR startup, Improbable Worlds, in one of the largest venture capital deals seen in the UK in the last decade. Now, Improbable Worlds creates virtual scenarios for gaming and massive-scale simulation. This round brings total funding for the British startup to $550 million and an at least $1 billion valuation. We caught up with Improbable CEO Herman Narula and asked if this funding round was the amount he was hoping for. To a lot of people, but I think what people don't see is that you know our plan is to literally build new realities, you know, massive scale simulations that you and I can you know potentially have completely new experiences inside. That is a 10-year plan, and it will take an enormous amount of technology investment and time, even beyond where we are now, to fully realize that vision. So for us, this was a logical next step in preparing the company to not only deliver for its current kind of commercial objectives, but also invest in what the technology could become in the future. Talk to us a little bit about what the technology could become in the future. It's real-world applications, it's simulation applications. Where do you think the real fruit is hanging at the moment, whether it's low or high? So people talk a lot about AI as a category. And what AI does is basically allow us to answer questions today about large sets of data that we have and find patterns in the past. What this technology represents is the ability to actually recreate reality at very large scale. So you could take a market or a city or a piece of infrastructure and actually model its behavior um, to a scale and a degree that wouldn't have been possible previously. And what we do to provide that is basically enable that massive computation to take place. So we're hoping to be a foundational technology for a lot of different applications. And um, that said, I think the potential in gaming is, is really gigantic and perhaps underappreciated. Talk to us about the gaming application because so, you've actually got a new application out at the moment. Yes, it's trending yeah. on Twitch. Tell us all yeah. about it. So Worlds Adrift is the, is the game in question. So the, the applications in gaming are really about going from single experiences where people are being separated into small groups of players on replica servers or playing in very static worlds to really creating massive shareable experiences with millions of simulated entities inside them. And that's just a huge sea change in the experience. All of a sudden, you're not playing to a script. You're able to have experience that are being defined by you and your friends in a really fundamental way. And Worlds Adrift is one of the first virtual worlds to have um, a massive, gigantic world with everyone in the same world. Um, and also it has the ability to have physics in great detail on the back end, which hasn't been possible previously. So all of these trends are just going to lead to just deep engagement in games. I'm thinking of mass market people, a ma amount of people able to game all at the same time yes. in the same virtual world. What does that mean money-wise? How do you monetize these sorts well, of games? Well, it's a really good question. So monetization tends to be proportional to engagement, the degree to which someone cares about the world, wants to be in the world. This technology makes those worlds even more compelling and engaging. So people want to be in them longer, see them as being a more valuable investment in their time and money, and ultimately it creates more different, you know, more opportunities for monetization, um, particularly if you have huge social groups all participating at the same time. It creates competitive behavior, which creates even more monetization potential. So the monetization that you have envisaged, is it the freemium model where it's free to play, but then you're buying certain things within the virtual reality? real world or yeah I think people are going to invest a lot more in the things they purchase within these virtual worlds because they become more engaging so property in virtual worlds items all manner of things suddenly become an enormous sink in in, in people's time investment and interest 
So that's the gaming element and the fact that you think that that is potentially un really not understood quite yet as to the sheer scale that this could become. But the real world applications you mentioned, I'm thinking smarter cities, I'm thinking, and what other applications? I mean, it's, it's really about better decisions. So many of the large projects, choices, policies, interventions that are done in the world are based on effectively static models of how the world works. Mm. If we could build massive simulations that actually recreate these systems in their entirety, then seeing how, say, a power failure might affect a city in a cascading way, or how a terrorist attack could be ameliorated through better um, development of infrastructure, all become feasible possibilities for the future. Our government's talking to you, particularly after Manchester, we think of this week, the terrorist attacks. Well, we're very fortunate that we've had a lot of support from the British government and we've done uh, work with government on infrastructure simulation, which is um, beginning to bear some fruit. So SoftBank comes in and gives you half a billion. What do they want to see out of this in particular? So I think, you know, not wanting to kind of put words in Masayoshi's, uh, Masayoshi san's head, but um, the interactions that I have had show me that they're interested in a very long term technical vision. I think they believe, as we do, that virtual worlds are going to become a fundamental change in the way that we live, work, and play, and the way that we kind of run our society. So I think for them, much like us, it's about a long term investment in the future. And it was interesting because we had a, a quite a competitive sort of round process. And I think what won us over to working with SoftBank was not just their vision, but also the sheer scale of their operations and the potential synergies that we see between other things that they're doing. I asked you at the beginning whether you wanted that amount of money, and you say certainly you can put it to work, but SoftBank has a reputation perhaps giving startups more money than they ask for. Is that the case with you? And, and is there so, any negative? So I think that's a fair um, worry, I think, for the scene in general, the idea of you know, too much money going into companies at the wrong stage. I think in our specific case, we were looking to raise on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars. So it was within the context of what we were looking to raise and to do. And we had a relatively competitive process. We're also fortunate that you know, we have investors like Andreessen Horowitz and you know, Horizon Ventures and Selena Chow who have become amazing advisors to us. So for us, we have the, the benefit of being able to consider these options in the context of very experienced partners who have helped us to see why this is the right move. Would it delay any IPO process? What is your view on I, Well, I think certainly this kind of private capital does mean that you can think differently about approaching the public markets. And, and you know, for us, with a long-term technology play, yes, that is an interesting, um, I think, probable uh, cause of that, and it will take us longer before we, we feel it's time to do that. But I think, in general, it doesn't have to be um, something that prevents companies from going public, because fundamentally, like getting liquidity for early employees, being put into a position where you can access even more capital, I, I think there's still an attraction to, to floating. Um, and perhaps one day when we reach that stage, we will look to do that too. That was improbable CEO Herman Narugla there. Now coming up, we'll have more on SoftBank closing its almost $100 billion vision fund as we discuss this week's top tech headlines. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. The U.S. is taking full responsibility for leaking information from Monday's bomb attack in Manchester. British Prime Minister Theresa May says she discussed it with President Trump at the G7 summit in Italy. Yes, I did raise the issue of leaks of uh, information that have been shared by the police with uh, the FBI with President Trump. He has uh, made clear that that was unacceptable. Uh, the Metropolitan Police have, I as I understand it, received assurances from the FBI and are now uh, have re restarted the process of sharing information with them. President Trump has ordered the Justice Department to find out who is responsible for those leaks. Theresa May also met with her French counterpart, Emmanuel Macron, for the first time on the sidelines of the G7 summit in Italy. Both disagreed over Brexit negotiations. Macron insists trade will not be discussed until the UK settles all its obligations. The election campaign resumed in the UK today with the latest poll showing the Labour Party within five points of Conservatives. Now, Theresa May's Conservatives once held a 20-point lead. UK Shadow Home Secretary Diane Abbott laid out parts of the Labour agenda to Bloomberg News. 
Our next priority is protecting jobs, protecting living standards, protecting the economy, protecting things like financial services. And we will not, as Theresa May has done, prioritise controlling immigration. Not to say that we don't believe you shouldn't have fair rules and management of migration. We will prioritise the economy. That's right. what will be different. President Trump and the UN Security Council condemned the attack on a bus carrying Coptic Christians in Egypt. At least 28 people are dead. Dozens of others are wounded after gunmen opened fire as the bus headed for a monastery. In Sri Lanka, at least 91 people are dead and more than 100 are reported missing after flooding and mudslides. Some 8,000 people have been displaced from their homes. Anti-government protesters continue to square off with police in Venezuela. Police used water cannons and tear gas as they blocked a highway in Caracas. More than 50 people have been killed since protests started nearly two months ago. The Pentagon is reportedly planning the first ever intercept test to stop an intercontinental range missile, similar to the ICBM being developed by North Korea. That's according to the AP. The test is reportedly set for this month. The U.S. successfully tested the $36 billion ground-based missile defense system on intermediate range missiles three years ago. And people are getting ready for Ramadan in Beirut, Lebanon. Muslims do not eat or drink from dusk to dawn during the holiest month of the Islamic calendar. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in London. This week, SoftBank, with Masayoshi San at the helm, announced it closed the first round of funding for its Vision Fund with $93 billion in the coffers. Now, earlier, we spoke to Bloomberg Technology Executive Editor Tom Giles in San Francisco, as well as Bloomberg Technology EMEA team leader Giles Turner here in London, about SoftBank and the other tech headlines that grabbed our attention this week. What's happening right now in Silicon Valley is there's a lot of concern among venture capitalists that there's going to be this extra this extra cash flowing in and, and inflating the value of, of, of these companies and making it harder for the existing shareholders um, or new shareholders to get in at a valuation that's, that's right for them, that makes them feel comfortable, that makes them feel like, hey, we've got a lot of upside here. If someone else is going to come in and willing to give, uh, give this startup uh, you know, the terms that are much friendlier to them, uh, that can box out some of the other players. So it's definitely uh, making having its presence felt across Silicon Valley even before the money starts flowing in. And Giles, it's interesting, there was a great piece by Bloomberg done saying, look, put it in perspective, a $100 billion fund is the same as all the money that came from the hedge funds and private equity in the whole of 2016. So this is a big chunk of change. And also going to the public markets, not yeah. only private. We saw it with Arm Holdings. It was a listed company here in the UK. And already they sell down some of their stake. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, a really important point to make. This fund isn't just going to be buying small companies, it's going to be buying very large companies as well. They're not interested in just taking a small stake in a public company. They want to take strategic stakes. They want to mix these stakes with their other companies. It's not, uh, it's not don't think of it as an investment fund. It's a conglomerate, really. And they've mm. got a very big vision about where they want to take the companies they're investing in. I want to switch gears here. And, and we have to move from what are perhaps opportunities to invest to then some very sad facts that have happened to the United Kingdom. We started off the week Week, Tom, in a negative fashion in the fact that we had, of course, the terrorist attack in Manchester. And this seems to have taken on a technology angle as the week has progressed, because here, the United Kingdom seems to be wanting to cramp down on encryption, but, well, potentially have back doors made available. It seems a deja vu to San Bernardino to a certain extent. Can you remind us? Yes, absolutely. What happened there was when there was the, uh, the t there was a terror attack in Southern California, San Bernardino. Um, it was found out later that the terrorists used iPhones to communicate with each other. There was a big battle here in uh, in the United States over whether um, and to what extent Apple should give the U.S. government access uh, to the communications that that we expect to be safe on our phones and and hidden. Um, 
from intrusion. Um, Apple, uh, Apple very much, very vehemently opposed that um, in a very high profile case. It turns out that the, that the government was able to get the information, unlock, decrypt those phones in, a, in sort of a, a backdoor manner. Um, so the legal battle was, was, was dropped. But we're going to see this time and time again where bad actors are using social media, using consumer electronics to prop, send, sell, uh, to disseminate propaganda, to gain support for their causes, to communicate uh, among each other. Um, and we saw Theresa May come out in light of the, uh, the, Ariane, uh, the attack at the concert earlier this week, um, asking for greater cooperation from the likes of Facebook in helping them clamp down on, on hateful speech, on ways that these groups are able to to organize on social media. Jazz, what's the reaction, do you think, from the UK public and indeed the technology companies here? Do you think that they will fight back against this amid the current environment? I think they'll certainly fight back. I mean, we were speaking to a government official and he gave uh, the, us a steer that there's a range of reactions from the tech companies. He wouldn't name any tech companies, but he said, well, some of them are very willing to work with the UK government, because the UK government is really leading this on a global scale, I think. Some of them are happy to work with them, others are really fighting back. And it'd be interesting to see what the UK government is going to do to force these companies to, to, to go along with their plans. Now, taking a rather hard left out of what is of course a very sad and, and emotive subject to one where maybe a few more investors are hopeful. Let's talk Spotify. Let's talk European IPOs. Let's talk this week that the music startup looks like it's edging yet ever closer, Giles, to a public offering of whatever sort it might be. Public directors, that seems to help. I think so. If this is just essentially uh, a bit of housekeeping. I think they're getting the right people on the board. It makes it look like it's a proper IPO. But remember, this is not going to be a proper IPO. They're yeah. not going to be doing this big book running. They're not going to be searching for the right investors. They're certainly letting people who already hold uh, Spotify stock to be able to sell it on a public market. It'll be really interesting to see those first few minutes even when this, th this thing does eventually happen to see what peak price people really put on Spotify stock. And Tom, it, what's interesting is we are seeing the European and the US IPO markets still readily available to the new entrants. Today, even in the United Kingdom, we had Alpha, which is a, a fin financial technology company, software company, 30% higher. We saw other IPOs in the week in the US as well. Is the time still to go? Yeah, absolutely. We, we expect there to be a much bigger pipeline this year. There continues to be so much bullishness in the market despite despite you know uncertainty on, on the political front in certain areas, um, the kinds of attacks we saw that we were just talking about. Um, the attitude toward the public markets, in, in fact, is very, very positive. We see the tech companies going from record to record, so that's always going to um, inform the IPO market. That was Bloomberg Technologies, Giles Turner and Tom Giles. Now, another big tech story this week, Bitcoin has been on a tear. The cryptocurrency known for its volatile moves topped $2,800 this week, but has since come down quite a bit. Joining us to discuss Bitcoin's wild swings is Bloomberg editor-at-large, Corey Johnson from San Francisco. Talking of wild swings, Corey, I'm looking at my Bloomberg. G hashtag BTV8860. If you've got a Bloomberg, type it in and you'll see on the moment just how much we are seeing that it is double the price of gold get into the Bloomberg terminal and you see it was only a month ago that we were about the same price as gold back in March, back in April, now almost double. Talk us through it, Corey. Well, we've seen some tremendous speculation about the value of Bitcoin and uh, uh, you see the price surging like that and it, it's, it's obviously dramatic when compared to gold. It, it's, it's, and some people on the margin see it as not, not, maybe not a reserve currency but something that might offer some sort of stability. But in fact, it's quite the opposite of that. And we can see that from the trading uh, just in the last week. You showed, uh, we showed briefly that five-day chart. But what you saw in the five-day chart was just tremendous volatility that, that in the course of essentially an hour's trading, uh, on I think it was on Thursday, you saw the stock, uh, the stock. you saw the Bitcoin uh, value d fall 15% in less than an hour. Uh, the next morning, there were a couple of trades that were even lower where you saw a 21% swing in the course of basically you know, less than 100 minutes of trading. 21%. So the notion that this is sort of some sort of reserve currency or safety is bonkers because of the volatility involved. But of late, there has been a great transfer of wealth into Bitcoin, and you can see that value uh, increasing dramatically. 
Yeah, not for the faint-hearted. It seems that potentially some countries like Japan perhaps adding a little bit more legitimacy, China cracking down slightly less on the use of these cryptocurrencies. I'm interested in, in the rivals to Bitcoin as well because we don't have them tracked on the Bloomberg yet, but they're yeah. on a tear as well. You're looking at Ether, which uses Ethereum technology. You're thinking of Ripple XRP, which uses Ripple Labs. I mean, all of this, we're seeing 2,000% plus gains in these particular cryptocurrencies. They it's, seem to be used more by corporates. It, it's very interesting. And yet, uh, when we talk to people within the world of Bitcoin, uh, what they say is that a lot of the transactions taking place in the last week have actually been swapping of digital currencies for digital currencies. In particular, a lot of uh, uh, sales of, of, of things like Ripple and, and others uh, into R R Ripple XPT, not to be confused with the company Ripple, which has, has got a sort of different uh, business model these days. But uh, uh, that, that there's actually been a lot of transfer out of some of the alternative currencies and into Bitcoin. But with those great profits, it might look like some people might be going back to those other currencies, bidding them both up sort of left hand and right hand. But uh, what it seems to be is some, uh, some coalescing around Bitcoin as the alternative currency of choice, which is interesting because we also hear from people, we talked to Brad Gerlinghouse recently on Bloomberg Radio, uh, Brad uh, Gerlinghouse is the CEO of Ripple, and what he says is that uh, there's actually a lot of trouble completing transactions in Bitcoin, that the, the Bitcoins themselves are becoming so laden with code that it's taking longer and longer to complete these transactions with Bitcoin, which uh, ironically might make the, uh, well, it makes the currency, uh, uh, well, the currency becomes more valuable, it becomes less valuable to use because it's harder to close transactions. And latency and an issue but uh what about also there's another way of perhaps betting on future startups you don't just buy their shares but you perhaps buy their new cryptocurrencies being forged yeah i think i think what we're really seeing uh, uh writ large is that bitcoin is being accepted in more and more places so uh, as you might expect some startups are willing to accept bitcoin both as a commerce uh for their platform but also in terms of investments because they see that uh, getting paid. I was meeting with an investor named uh, Brad Rotter in San Francisco a few weeks ago who tells me that for years he's been paying his son's allowance in Bitcoin. Now the kid's not even working. He's just enjoying the fruits of that allowance that he's been <laughs> stocking aside because the Bitcoin has become so valuable. Maybe one for your daughters, Corey. Thank you very much indeed. Blue oh, Corey Johnson. that's not happening. Fant <laughs> Fantastic analysis as ever. Happy weekend. Thank you. Now, on-demand food delivery startup Sprig has announced it's shutting down. The San Francisco-based company had raised more than $56 million from investors. But Bloomberg reported just last week that it is burning $850,000 a month and seeking a buyer. Now, Sprig is the latest food delivery startup to close its doors after struggling to scale. Maple, Spoon Rocket and India's Ola have all closed up shop in the past 18 months. Still, there is some optimism in the industry. Alibaba led an investment round this week of at least $1 billion in one of China's biggest food delivery firms. Food for thought, maybe. Coming up, Macquarie Group cuts its rating on TripAdvisor, sending shares down to its lowest level since 2012. We'll speak with an analyst on the biggest threat to the company. This is Bloomberg. Now, TripAdvisor shares dropped 2% in trading today. The stock fell to its lowest intraday since 2012 and extended a weekly decline to over 11%. Macquarie Group senior analyst Matthew Brooks cut his rating on the stock to underperform. The firm believes that travel search will be disrupted by AI technology. Joining us from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, is Matthew Brook of Macquarie. Matthew, thank you very much for joining us. Your call helped shave, what, about 100 million, it would seem, off of the market cap of TripAdvisor today. Talk to us about why you're going underperform, because it really does seem to be competition here. Right. So, yes, we downgraded this morning, you know, as part of a transfer of coverage. So, really, my first report on this name. Um, and really, when I started to look at it, to me, it looked like a broken growth stock because, you know, earnings have been falling since 2014. You know, EBITDA fell 25 percent last year, and yet the market's willing to pay more for TripAdvisor than they are for Priceline, even though Priceline delivers pretty strong growth. Now, if you listen to the CEO, he will admit that, that Google is their biggest competitor, but there's still a lot of investors who I think underestimate what this means. You know, a lot of investors think that TripAdvisor is the top of the travel funnel and that they could be for travel what Amazon is for retail, but I just don't see how that's going to happen given the competition with Google. 
So for a start, you know, Google, if you look at the traffic, you know, they have over 75 times the traffic that TripAdvisor does, and it's a lot more loyal because people are Googling things every single day. You know, it's a verb for a reason. Uh, and if you, you know, flow on from that, you know, Google has a flight search product. And if you track that, there's more US searches for Google flights now than there are for TripAdvisor. Um, which is showing you know, pretty strong growth and it shows what they can do with that big user base in terms of growing some sort of travel search product. But yeah. it's really hotels that makes the difference. Um, and in hotels, you know, Google's now putting their hotel search product on top of the organic search results. And the magic of the TripAdvisor model in the past was the free traffic they got basically from all those user-generated reviews. And, and that's just not going to happen as much in the future. So that means they're going to probably have to spend more to get traffic um, to try and compete with Google, who are basically the center of the internet and the first yeah. place people start when they look for travel. Matthew. Matthew, I mean, looking at your call, you're one of five cells. I'm going into the Bloomberg now, typing in ANAR analyst recommendations, you being one of them. Five cells. We do still have three buys, but the most of them are holds at the moment. And I want to understand why the rest of the market isn't kind of thinking that perhaps TripAdvisor can't step up and do the AI itself, can't step up and its new app that it delivered this week make a difference. Why are you feeling that perhaps they can't manage to be getting ahead and dabble into the artificial intelligence itself as well? I think the biggest reason why most of the analysts are sort of sitting on the fence at the moment is that they can see that some of the competition from Google, but they also think that the stock is going to get taken over. And you know, to me, ah. you know, if you look at the rise of voice, uh, voice search, I, I just don't see how that's going to happen. You know, the, the person or company that's always rumored as the, the, the one that might buy it is Priceline, but they have 120 million of their own reviews. You know, they're really going to pay you know, five or six billion dollars to get all the TripAdvisor's reviews when you know, they're going to need to invest in all this technology as well. Um, there's yeah. not necessarily a reason to buy another company at the same time. What do you want to hear from Steve Kelfer, the CEO, if it's not, yes, we understand Google is our number one competitor, what more would it do to persuade you to perhaps look a little bit more favorably? What they would need to do is they would need to convince me that they can get traffic and grow that traffic without having to pay a lot for it. Uh, and then they can convert people with more bookings and that they will invest in some of this new travel technology because the way I see it in the future, what people want is they want to ask, you know, they want to ask Siri or their Amazon Echo, you know, I want to go on a, a trip to Orlando this weekend, you know, what hotels can I stay at? And they want to get like three or five options that are personalized and customized to them. Um, and I think that's going to take a big investment. And I'm not sure that TripAdvisor could yeah. make that investment, but they should at least be trying. I mean, if you look at what Carnival's doing in, in travel with their ocean medallion, you know, that's really what the future of travel is about, you know, providing a more personalized service using technology, artificial intelligence, et cetera. Matthew Brooks, senior analyst with Macquarie, thank you very much for giving so much of your time on this Friday. And we will keep up with all your calls on both Carnival and indeed TripAdvisor. Now, coming up, the company that has been referred to as the Airbnb of the car industry. We'll take a look at how everyday car owners are expanding their collections of Hondas to Alfa Romeos. This is Bloomberg. Now, Elon Musk may be missing out on the U.S. SUV boom. Tesla's upcoming Model S sedan has racked up thousands of orders, but the Model X sports utility vehicle well, it hasn't met the CEO's expectations. Deliveries have yet to keep pace with the Model S, as Musk predicted. And according to IHS, U.S. registrations of the Model X have slipped the last two quarters. Musk blames the struggles on making the vehicle too complicated. Now, whether you're looking to buy the latest Tesla or less tech-savvy vehicles, it seems it's a debt-laden business owning a car with a record of 107 million Americans currently carrying auto loan debt. One peer-to-peer -peer car sharing platform is creating its own entrepreneurial ecosystem. On the platform Turo, car owners are not only renting out their vehicles to help finance their rides, but even incentivizing some owners to invest in more cars and often higher quality. I love Porsches. And so how many? I have five. 
Kent Liu owns 11 vehicles, from Porsches to Jaguars and an Alfa Romeo. He rents out his fleet on the car-sharing app Turo, frequently referred to as the Airbnb for cars. Well, I started in 2013. I started with the, the Honda Accord, and I purchased that car specifically to, you know, rent out to test out the uh, peer-to-peer car sharing model. You know, it was really successful, so I figured, you know, why not scale it? So I've been adding cars to my fleet ever since. According to Turo, the average monthly earnings for owners on the platform is $720. And if they have more than three cars, they can make over $3,000 per month. The vehicles don't have to be high-end sports cars. Demand just really went off the charts. The 15-year-old Honda was being rented all the time. People loved it. Anne Connolly joined four years ago with her 2002 Honda CRV and has since purchased two additional vehicles to rent out. It wasn't really ever a full-on intention to run a business, a car rental business, but it just sort of happened. Since Turo is a peer-to-peer -peer service, they act as the middlemen, so they don't own the cars, pay for parking or servicing. They take care of all the marketing, uh, the back-end support, insurance is, is also the key thing that they take care of. Car sharing will not be a true game changer, according to the Boston Consulting Group. Still, they project 35 million people worldwide will use a type of this service by 2021. That's up from just 6 million users in 2015. And it's become far more popular in Europe and Asia than in North America. The way I see it is if the car is rented out, you know, more than 50% of the month, then, you know, it's time to get another car. It's all about meeting that demand for these high-end vehicles. Definitely see why I want to trade up. That was fun. Now that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We'll be back on the air Tuesday after the Memorial Day holiday in the US and the bank holiday here in the UK. If you're enjoying those holidays, have a wonderful time. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>